Well, good evening, folks. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we will go ahead and get started. So we have plenty of time for the talk. Um, just to let you know, we are recording. So if you have folks that weren't able to make it tonight or you want to check this out again afterwards, uh, again, go to the Grit City Think and Drink website, which is down there on the screen. And uh, you can check out this and all the past talks, uh, with the exception of the last one, which uh, yours truly forgot to record. So uh, you can actually see the slides from the last talk. Uh, but that was the one uh, where I forgot to push record. So we are recording right now because I will never do that again. Um, welcome. Uh, happy Tuesday. Uh, because it's April, we got snow today because, um, you know, that's normal around here. Um, but I'm glad that you all joined us. Um, my name is Jim Gal. I'm a professor at the University of Washington Tacoma and your host for the Grit City Think and Drink we are hoping to get this thing back in person. If uh, knock on wood, cross your fingers, uh, maybe we actually stay healthy for a little bit. Um, so I'll be letting you know the details if we're able to move this uh, in person sometime soon. But otherwise, uh, keep an eye on the website and it'll tell you where we're, um, where we're uh, hosting from. So um, we'll um, hopefully get back in person sometime soon so we can all share a toast together. Um, but just to let you know, um, if you haven't been here before, again, this happens the second Tuesday of every month. So our next one is May 10th. We are still uh, waiting on final word as to our speaker for May 10th. Uh, so show up anyway or check out the website and you'll see what the speaker is coming up as soon as we have it uh, nailed down. So I hope you will join us um, wherever that may be. Um, and just to give you a, a quick rundown, so I will introduce our speaker. She'll give you an amazing talk to knock your socks off. Uh, we will then have a quick question and answer where we'll give away some think and drink uh, swag. Um, and then we'll do a uh, stump the speaker Q&A session right after that. So get your chat fingers ready because that's how we do both the giveaway and the, um, uh, and the Q&A is by chat. So everybody hopefully knows where that is on your screen. Um, but without further ado, I will introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Marilyn Ostergren, I should say Dr. Mar Marilyn Ostergren, uh, is a three-time Husky. Um, uh, she was got her undergraduate degree in 87, her master's degree in 92, and a PhD in 2013. So she has seen the place change uh, over time, I believe. Uh, and uh, she is a tenacious advocate of people and the planet. She started working with the UW Sustainability Office in 2008 before it actually officially existed. Uh, and she's volunteered to create graphics for the Carbon Action Plan uh, when she started that out. Uh, so she would have been, uh, well, you're a grad student at that point, is that correct? Uh, she is currently interim director of the Office of Sustainability, um, but we'll pass that baton on to the new director who was just hired, uh, and she will come on board in May 2022. And uh, Marilyn will go back to just working on sustainability in all the different forms that she has done before. Um, so really happy to have her here tonight. Uh, and thank you for coming. And Marilyn, it's all yours. Thank you, Jim. OK. I'll share my screen now. Great. So I, I titled this talk, You and the Sustainability Action Plan, How We Can Make It real for all of us. And that sort of reflects my dream and ambition that uh, that the sustainability plan will get more and more relevant and impactful for every everyone and every member of the UW community. So I'm going to start by going over the five guiding principles and the 10 targets and uh, walk you through it. So the guiding principles is kind of the, the overall vision. So the first is ensure students achieve sustainable literacy. So we want every UW graduate to walk out with a solid grounding in sustainability and, and a solid experience of sustainability, frankly. Um, the second is to choose our research conscientiously. So that refers to the, the products of the university, the knowledge we produce, that it, that it uh, is reflective of our awareness of what it takes to be sustainable. Uh, the third is keep equity and inclusion at the center. So we want to be sure that this is an inclusive effort and not, not in any way exclusive or narrow. Um, use resources responsibly is the fourth that sort of speaks for itself. And then finally, to decarbonize. So those are the guiding principles. This is a five-year plan and 
it gets refreshed every year. And then um, the idea is that it will be uh, sort of deeply refreshed after five years, but we currently have 10 targets. So on this slide, uh, I'll, I'll walk through what these are very briefly and then go into each of them in more detail. One is around engagement with sustainability. One is around, um, I think of it as being around academics. The third one, the third target is around research. The fourth, purchasing. The fifth, professional travel. The sixth is around food. The seventh is about commuting. The eighth is about energy use in buildings. The ninth is about, is about uh, waste and recycling. And then the final one is about greenhouse gas emission reduction. Okay, so let's walk through each of those. Uh, engagement. So um, this one we're working on tweaking and, and integrating it more. So we're, we'll, in the next year, hopefully we'll focus on engagement with each of the targets. Right now, it's, it's been a little bit isolated and you know, we've been trying to track things like attended at events, but that just doesn't, you know, just barely scratches the surface. Um, but, the, but the blue sky wish, the dream is that everyone will be engaged, um, meaning uh, it will be, sustainability will be infused in courses, in all research, in our decision-making, um, and that everyone will be aware of it. Of course, that's, a, that's, that's our blue sky wish. Um, let's see. And we, we're, we're looking at all forms of engagement with sustainability, not just in sort of the typical traditional ways. Uh, here's here, this slide is just an example of engagement at UW Tacoma, the, the garden there. Um, and I'll move on. The second, the second target, uh, it refers to creating a sustainability framework. So um, one of the things we've done for this target is develop a list of courses across the um, 150 plus academic units to show and help uh, students discover the, the breadth of sustainability courses across campus. We're working, we've, we've, we've created our initial list and we're working on, on um, tweaking that with, with um, vetting it essentially with each of the academic departments. Another big piece of this target was to create a definition of sustainability. I'm going to go over this here in a moment, but we we put this together with through conversations with faculty, staff, and students at all three campuses. It was recently um, reviewed by the board of deans and chancellors, and then blessed or um, endorsed rather by Anamari at the Seattle campus. Okay, so what this what this definition says is. Um, at the University of Washington, we define sustainability as the capacity to create, maintain healthy, equitable, and diverse communities and ecosystems. So I'm going to pause a bit. So sustainability, sustainability, the idea that it's our ability to sustain, our ability to, to sustain ourselves, our capacity. And by healthy, equitable, and diverse communities and ecosystems, we are, of course, referring to all sorts of communities, human and humans, animals, human uh, environment, um, healthy meaning, you know, well-functioning, equitable and diverse. So they're not rigid systems, they're, they're, they're um, resilient systems. Okay, then, the, then that capacity to create those, those communities comprises thing, three things. One is an understanding and respect for the interdependence of us all, the atmosphere, the waters, the land, all life on earth. And then full recognition of impacts of human activity, both the legacy, you know, we need to understand how we got here to know how to address it, as well as our ongoing impacts. And then finally, that capacity requires a commitment to cultivate collective wisdom, meaning not just, you know, the wisdom of siloed experts, but the, the collective wisdom that comes when we bring all perspectives together and see what, what wisdom and knowledge re, um, emerges from that. And then to act deliberately out of that understanding, re, re, respect and recognition. So it's an exciting definition and our ambition now is to fully understand and implement this definition. So that, that, that it, we, this was uh, just endorsed uh, the other week. So 
we have our work ahead of us. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, research, and that refers both to you know the the research done by the university for the world at large, but also to research done on campus. So the idea of campus is a living lab. Um, we currently have you know, scattered examples of awesome campus as a living lab research. This image is from a pollinator study at the Bothell campus. Um, and we're, we're wanting to work toward having that be a more robust and well-supported pro program across campuses. Okay, our next target number four is about purchasing. And as of now, we've focused on two things that are currently in place. One is we have goals for purchasing from um, what we call women and minority owned businesses. We want to increase the amount of purchasing that happens to support those businesses. We also have a supplier code of conduct and we want to you know, more deeply enact and leverage that to, to um, to ensure that, that we're encouraging our suppliers to, to abide by um, this code of conduct. Um, so, you know, Blue Sky, the university, of course, is an enormous org organization with enough purchasing power to have real influence. So to use that purchasing power for good to, um, to elevate the marketplace and to support businesses that are aligned with, with our values and with sustainability. Next, we have professional travel. And this is actually one of the ones I know the most about because I've sort of overseen uh, that work with a, with a, um, with a working group. Um, so, so initially we started out with the idea that we would achieve th this goal of reduced travel through primarily through off offsets. Um, our working group has done a lot of research on, on offsets and been very concerned about the, the potential for those not to have the impact we want them to have. Um, we've conducted a survey of travel behavior to better understand why people travel um, and whether they would like to reduce their travel. Um, we've, oh, I'll show you the next page. We've, we've polished our, our mechanism for gathering and presenting data. So here you can see the dramatic impact that COVID had on our flight, on our um, professional, our air travel. Um, the gold is, is Seattle campus, the purple is Tacoma campus, and then the dark gold is the Bothell campus. Um, and then we started having conversations. And it, this of course is, is a very challenging goal to address because travel is integral to some of the great things we do, to getting out in the world, to conducting research across the globe, to having students have awesome study abroad experiences. Um, so, so the challenge is to figure out how, how to retain the, the positive impacts of travel without the environmental impact. And one of the inspiring stories we've come across was from a, a group that studies infectious diseases in pediatric infectious diseases and does much of their research in Africa. So with COVID, without being able to go over there, they had to figure out how to continue to conduct their research. And they ended up basically, instead of flying over there and doing the re research, they built relationships with local people and you know trained them. So they, they now have sort of this capacity instead of leaving the country and, le and leaving that capacity behind the, the people there um, have, have those skills and, and much stronger relationships with the, the, the people at the UW. So there are some exciting possibilities for um, leveraging what we learned in, through COVID to reduce our travel. Uh, the next one is food. And we started off focusing on reduce or increasing the amount of local food we purchased and have moved toward recognizing that um, focusing on plant-based foods is ultimately more impactful than focusing on local. Um, and um, housing and first food services, which, which um, you know, is the major food outlet for on, on campus has a number of programs to work in this direction, one of which is to buy from the UW farm. This is the Seattle UW farm. 
Um, but but the, the blue sky vision is to not just focus on housing and food services, but to think about the whole food ecosystem, all the people who come to camp, our three campuses and where do they get their food and what can we do to reduce barriers to buying you know, food that nourishes body, mind, and the planet. Uh, next, we have commuting. And, you know, for a very long time, we've, we've worked to increase commute modes that are more sustainable and, and minimize single occupancy vehicles. Um, of course, COVID has had a dramatic effect here too. So these bars, I realize it's a little covered up, but transit, over time, you know, since we've been tra tracking since 1990, bicycling, walking, shared modes, drive alone. It wasn't until 2015 that we started to track telecommuting. Oh, and I realized I haven't fixed this slide, but in 2020, of course, our telecommuting exploded. So 80% of commuters were telecommuters and only, what is it, six or eight, 8% uh, 8 drove alone. And now, you know, we're looking to the future of work. And so, for example, um, the facilities, which is the department that the sustainability, the Seattle Sustainability Office is under, they're moving because their buildings are going to be demolished. And so, we're we're going to be experimenting. Campus is a living lab with workspaces where people don't have assigned desks, but there are various spaces they can move to depending on their needs at the time. So, and you know requiring less space because they're finding that a substantial percentage of people want to continue to telecommute. So stay tuned. Okay. And then next we have target eight is building EUI. EUI stands for energy use intensity. So making buildings more efficient. Um, and so Tacoma has a, um, you know, is doing well in this regard. You have Stanley Joshua, who's who's amazing, and mostly you know new and renovated, recently renovated buildings. Seattle campus has a lot of elderly buildings um, that use uh, um, older equipment. So this is a, a reflection of the energy vision that our new executive director of energy operations and utilities is putting together for us, where all of the commodities are metered. We have some individual metering, but we don't have a robust metering program that, that meters you know, water and electricity and in some cases, natural gas at each building and make sure that those meters are maintained. And then that data goes into a analytic system and that we have automated building controls. So, you know, remotely we can watch and see how the buildings are doing and where there's a problem and immediately address it. And we're anticipating substantial savings, substantial reductions in, in energy use and substantial savings in utility costs. So uh, we're, you know, the vision is there, we're headed down that path and now we're trying to figure out how to pay for it. Uh, and then target nine is about uh, waste and recycling. So again, COVID had a pretty dramatic impact on the amount of material that we that we dispose of. Um, but we've also had an assessment done, a zero waste assessment, and that came with um, a, a scoring system and pretty extensive recommendations that weren't just about how we dispose of things, but how we how we purchase things and, for example, making sure that we streamline the process of having people look at our uh, surplus system to be sure that there, there aren't products available there before they go and purchase new. And then finally, target 10 is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And there are sort of three sub parts to that. One is uh, fleet electrification. This is going well, you know, we're just, we're, we're at early days now, but it used to be that many of the types of vehicles simply weren't available in electric form and that has rapidly changed. So this basically is the schedule at which we will normally swap out vehicles and, you know, as retire vehicles, but as we retire internal combustion vehicles, we'll replace them with electric vehicles. So that one's going smoothly. This is a map of um, current solar installations on the Seattle campus. 
um, I didn't have a map for the other two campuses. There's a there's a great student group at the Seattle campus called UW Solar that is responsible for making most of these installations happen. But they've also uh, produced a solar plan, and um, the, you know the, that will probably never be more than. Well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, in the with current technology, we're looking at up to ten percent of our electricity coming from solar, which is not insignificant, and you know has some nice resilience pieces to it. Um, but you know, it, future technology, solar technologies, uh, who knows where we'll go. The one thing we're awaiting on here that's underway is a green revolving fund. So a fund where if you have a project that will ultimately save utility money, you can, you can borrow from that fund and the savings will pay it back. And that will make a big difference in making these uh, solar projects easier to fund. And then finally, this is another Seattle-based effort, but it, uh, it's big. It's again, part of our, our uh, campus energy vision, um, which is to decarbonize our district energy system. And so this is the pathway. So first we do what you saw for, for target eight, which is dramatically reduce the demand the buildings are placed, placing on our district system. And I should pause and say, what we do right now is we have our central power plant and it burns a lot of natural gas to produce steam, which is then sent out to the buildings in tunnels to heat the buildings. It also produced chilled water to cool the buildings it, just in summer. So uh, we want to reduce the demand on that system, transition away from steam, because that allows us to, if we have a lower temperature, hot water that's, that's moving the heat out to the buildings, we have the opportunity to use heat pumps to pull heat, you know, People are mostly familiar with air source heat, heat pumps where you pull it, uh, heat from the air or geothermal heat pumps. Um, number four is showing we, we have some resources that we can leverage, one being the sewer lines, massive sewer lines that run near the campus that have heat in it that we could potentially extract. The other unintuitively is actually the lake. We could extract both heating and cooling from the lake. And the little fish here is representing the fact that there's there's some research happening right now to look at whether we can make a big enough difference in the temperature of the Montlake cut. So that's you know the shipping canal that runs from Puget Sound to Lake Washington, which is getting toxic to fish because of the temperature. So the possibility of actually improving the conditions for the for the salmon as they as they migrate. And then finally, these are these are cooling towers. Um, that are releasing waste heat. And we could be capturing that as well and using it because sometimes you're, we're cooling, for example, a, a server room. At the same time, another part of campus needs that heat. So there's all sorts of potential for real efficiencies there. And then finally, you know, making this something that we can all participate in. Okay, so that, those are the 10 targets. And I have a couple of, let's see, do I have time? Yeah, I still have four minutes. I'm just gonna ask two questions. And the first one is, I want you to respond in the chat to share, pick two of these that you find most interesting that you would like to either participate in or see more, more information published about. I'll give you a few moments for that. Let's see, I'll look at the chat to see. You can either just put down a number or or a title. Yeah, campus is a living lab. That's the fun one. Don't be shy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, six food. Yeah, that's one that touches all of us, of course. One, three, and five. Thank you. Okay, keep answering that one. The next, the next question is which one do you, which one or two do you think are that the our highest priority that the university, if it needed to focus its resources, which which ones seem most important? Yeah. 
decarbonization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And professional travel, yeah, more carbon. Ah, uh, yeah, making sure that the people who walk away from our campus, yeah, do so with this newfound knowledge. Great. Thank you. Yep. Gee, greenhouse gases and pushing. So it's interesting that, yeah, some of the, the, it's different which ones are most interesting and which ones are most impactful, but good news is we're going to do them all. So. Okay, that's, that's the end of my presentation. I look forward to attempting to answer your questions that you'll attempt to stump me with. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. A virtual uh, round of applause. And since we have a small number of people, and I actually think I know, or at least uh, uh, I believe I have seen other folks uh, here in other talks, I'm going to take off some of the security so you guys can actually, if you would like, uh, you can uh, share your, you can uh, show yourselves, and uh, you can even unmute yourself if you want to ask your own question to our speaker tonight. So um, thank you. So uh, we'll take a, a short break here and we will give away some prizes. So uh, our prizes, if you can see these in my virtual background, are the Grit City Think and Drink socks, which are the coolest uh, UW socks ever. Um, so if you want to get a pair of these, uh, we are getting close to the, la to the bottom of these. So as you know, we've gone through different uh, clothing uh, options as we've gone along. So we've gone through hats, my shirt I don't have on today, uh, and we're on to socks. And after that, um, you guys get to decide what the next uh, Grit City Think and Drink swag will be. So definitely uh, let me know your ideas. Uh, but so we're going to give away two pairs of those. So get your chat fingers ready. Uh, make sure that you're chatting to me or to, um, actually I can also change that so you can chat to everybody. Let me fix that real quick. Um, so you can chat to whoever. So, uh, first question, uh, I was going to ask when the first, uh, Earth Day was, but I feel like that's a gimme and it kind of gives it to some, some older folks. So I'm going to ask something a little bit more pointed. So to see how you, you get this. So uh, greenhouse, the greenhouse effect or greenhouse gases was something Marilyn brought up in her, uh, the plan for UW. When was the greenhouse effect, when was that actually coined or when did that start to get used? I'll take a decade even. So when was the greenhouse effect first used as a term? Somebody said, or Sean says 1990s. Keep going, folks. 18C. Not sure what that means. 18th century, thank you. <laughs> 1800s, I'm guessing. Uh, maybe a little bit more than that, but it's not actually the 1800s. It's close, though. Other ideas, folks? 1950s. I have some folks not guessing. Come on, you can win some socks. The 20s from Damon. Anybody else got a guess? 1900. Linda wins herself a pair of socks. So it was 1901 from my research. Uh, it was used by somebody named Nils Gustav Eckholm. If you really want, if you want to win a bar bet at some point and not just some socks, that's something to pull in. So 1901. So amazingly, we've been talking about the greenhouse effect for more than 100 years at this point, 120 years. Uh, so, oh, before I forget, please, uh, if you win the socks, what you need to do is to message me, not to everybody, but to message me. Uh, your mailing address so I can get you the socks and the size socks that you wear. So if you can send those to me, Linda, congratulations on your socks. All right, the second question to win a pair of socks is, uh, I feel like uh, the Nobel Peace Prize getting connected to sustainability is definitely uh, is a big deal. And what I want to know is who was the youngest winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, which I feel was actually connected to sustainability. 
So who was the youngest winner of the Nobel Peace Prize that was somewhat connected to sustainability? Any ideas? I thought somebody would guess, guess Greta, but she has not won it yet. I would almost, almost positive she's got to be in the running. Other ideas? Oh, looks like the, I know people are got to be Googling this by now. There you go. Sean gets it. Is Malala. So Malala Yousafzai, uh, she was uh, 17 actually when she won the Nobel Peace Prize. And her work is related to uh, girls' education um, and uh, women's rights. And, I and that is definitely connected to sustainability and, and moving sustainability forward. So Sean, you get a pair of socks. If you send me your info, I can get them to you. I know I can get them to your office, but I just need to know your size, so. Thank you guys for playing. Uh, and then without further ado, uh, let me uh, open up the Q&A for Marilyn. So if you have questions, uh, you can chat them or you can unmute yourself and uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask them yourself. Either way, however you wanna do it. Um, well, Marilyn, let me start it off while people are thinking. So you talked about how do you get people involved so how have you asked those kind of questions of UWT or UW students right so what is it that gets UW students interested in sustainability how do you grab them uh have we asked it I'm sure we've asked it in many ways and what have they said you know we, we tend to ask the um the ones who are engaged like in the sustainability clubs, we need to broaden that. Well, no, I, I think sometimes we ask people who aren't and you know, are aware that we need to make our message more uh, interesting to a, a more diverse audience. Um, I don't know, it feels like they wanna be heard you know, and feel like they can have an impact. Mm -hmm. So there's, is there anything that you think, I don't know, that's interesting. I think uh, that's always a big question is how do you get, um, I, I feel like there has been more uh, voice, I think, from students about dealing with climate change and dealing with um, sustainability and addressing those questions. But, you know, you talked about engagement at the beginning, and I think that's a really good question. What is engagement? You know, what is it that... Um, students are given the opportunity to do mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. or encouraged to do mm -hmm. and and especially how do we make it something that's accessible to those students right mm -hmm. so if we're yeah at, at least for our students they're very busy with their classes and their jobs and everything else and so how do we work it in so that it's not an extracurricular activity that they mm -hmm. don't have the time mm -hmm. for i think that's a really good question yeah, and um, I mean, you know, one thing we want to expand our use of or our leveraging capstone projects, um, which we've done some and are, I actually have a meeting next week um, to talk with some more fa uh, faculty that have capstone projects to figure out how to engage students that way. I, I also, I, as I mentioned, felt good about the process we went through to create the sustainability definition where we, in fact, where students went to where they were at to courses and to um, the Campus Sustainability Fund um, board, but that's, it's hard to scale that, you know, um, but, but it, making some effort to go out and, and, you know, do focus groups and surveys, but um, it's, it, it's an ongoing challenge that we want to figure out. Sean, Sean has a question. I know, Sean. Greetings, Marilyn. Yes, sorry, I can't turn my camera on. It decided not to work all of a sudden, which is a bummer because uh, I, I have an awesome UW hat on. But anyway, um, <laughs> my question is, um, when I was still involved with the office, there was starting to be some connections with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Is there still some kind of um, interest or connection happening with some of those? Because I know 
I've seen them mentioned in like the Evans School and a couple other places mm -hmm. in UW Seattle of their mm -hmm. interest in engaging with those mm -hmm. and having them drive some of their activities. So has it played mm -hmm. out yet in the, the sustainability office and the sustainability plan? So good question, Sean. Um, and we still have Christoph with us who's <laughs> interested in that. I, I wouldn't say explicitly. Um, you know, AISHI, the American Association for Sustainability and Higher Education, they're, they've done more work to align the SDGs with, with the stars. Um, and I, I have, um, in looking around at other universities to see what we can emulate, Leeds University in the UK, uh, Leeds University in the UK does explicitly talk about those uh, and align them with their work. So short answer is not really, but there's, there's potential to do more. Thanks for the reminder, Sean. Yeah, great, thank you. I think there's a lot more of those, right? Isn't there close to 20 or so? In 17. The, what is it? 17. Uh, 17, yeah, I was gonna say, there's quite a few uh, of those, but yeah, I think that's an interesting question. How do they align? Well, and quite a few of them, especially the first ones, don't have anything to do with the environment, which is surprising to a lot of folks. It actually plays into a lot more of the things that uh, Marilyn actually mentioned here of, um, you know, why some of the other areas are starting to take a lot more interest in sustainability. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see where it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, and other questions, folks, Make uh, feel free to chat your questions or again, uh, unmute yourself, raise your hand, uh, ask a question for sure. Um, I was going to actually ask about the whole the grand plan for energy, right? So that's quite a quite a lift that uh, Seattle's looking to do. And I wonder, so what's the is there a time frame at all at this point? An idea of what this would take? Um, I hate to ask money questions because that's a whole different thing. But you know, how long would that take to actually pull off? Yeah. So. Uh, we have the state requirement that we reduce our emissions by 45% by 2030. Um, and that uh, this, the slide, what the vision was um, a 2030 vision. So mm -hmm. we are, I think that's, I think that's a stretch, but we're, we're looking at that, trying to figure out if we can do that to uh, certainly, well, get a good start on it by 2030. So we're, we can reduce our emissions by half. Um, yeah, and um, that I'm, 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 I'm trying to channel David Woodson, our, our energy executive, because um, he certainly has a sense of timeline. And I don't remember him saying anything beyond, yes, we can, we certainly should be into it by 2030. Um, I'm not sure exactly how long, because, you know, there will be, there will be a, a it, won't, it won't happen overnight. There will be quite a long period of transition and probably it'll happen like by zones, segments of the campus will be converted before others. Um, so uh, it looks like Linda has a question. Linda, go ahead. Hi, um, I remember one of the talks that we've had here was um, about changing our eating habits, you know, to plant-based uh, foods and and I was really surprised at how how much an impact of just changing one or two meals a week uh, had on you know uh, carbon um, output and uh, so I was wondering if there was something you know college students love to eat and you know you said that you were going to start incorporating um, cafeteria food with um, you know other kinds of options. And that, that was something that you could measure. Um, I mean, that might be an idea. Or, you know, how do you, how can you um, measure that the, um, you know, the students have actually incorporated some of these changes into their own life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Measuring is a hard part about a lot of this. Um, I, I did have a conversation recently with um, one of the, chefs at Housing and Food Services and someone from the Humane Society and they offer, this isn't quite an answering your question, but they offer a service where if we send them, you know, our, our list of purchases, they will calculate greenhouse gas emissions from those purchases. So there is the potential that we could 
measure at that level. Um, yeah, and, and it's, I mean, this is, you know, like the travel one it has it, such deep implications for personal behavior. It's, 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 it's a tricky one and wanting to be, you know, there's so many considerations, wanting to uh, make sure that the options that are available are meeting people's food needs and along all sorts of dimensions. Um, the Humane Society also offered um, cool um, sort of, you know, plant-based options to meet. Um, it was interesting to hear the, the chef who's clearly dedicated to this work and saying, you know, like some of these recipes while delicious and palatable take too much time and they're, they're constrained with their human resources. So it's, it's a good challenge. We're actually, I forgot to mention that we're working right now to put together a series of conversations around food and looking at things like uh, sustainable farming, food systems in general, um, food sovereignty, and then and issues around food, um, you know, like how food is marketed that creates, um, you know, tricky messages for people and, and alters our relationships to food with the idea that as part of those conversations, we will envision our ideal for what the university's food system looks like. So I'm hoping we'll get some good ideas out of that. Other questions, folks? I was wondering about transportation. So you brought up the idea this, and I've seen some surveys go around about like professional travel. So what has been the feedback that you've seen, or do you know of any yet on how faculty or feel about potentially how to deal with professional travel emissions? Cause it's a huge one for UW from what I know. Yeah, well, in that, in that survey, which was, I mean, we got 500 responses, which is pretty good for a survey, but you, uh, you also worry that, um, you know, there's bias in who responded, but we had almost, almost half of the people said they would like to travel less, you know, they find it inconvenient and stressful. So there's some hope that if we can address some of the incentives that make people feel that they have to travel, that they'll be happy to travel less, but, but yeah, it's an uphill battle. And, you know, there are, understandable reasons that people really like traveling um, and, and reasons they feel that they simply can't travel and continue to do their work. Mm -hmm. But, and that, that's actually, we, we, we haven't fully analyzed that data. So that's, that's a project that's out there. Um, so if you have students that <laughs> would be interested, Ellen Moore helped, helped us create that survey and, and is also open to helping us analyze it. Yeah, that would be really interesting. I, you know, I think one of the things that would be nice to analyze after, and, and maybe that's already being done, but not thinking about the bigger travel, but just meetings, right? So what, you know, what worked well or work, work, what works well for meetings that could be virtual and what doesn't, you know, when mm -hmm. is it good to be in the room with each other and when does it work mm -hmm. better? You know, it, when does it work fine without that? Um, or even, you know, some of the things I saw because of the number of conferences that went virtual was some conferences seemed to really get it right. Like you actually mm -hmm. felt like you were more engaged in a virtual conference than you would have been in the, the in-person conference and then other ones did not. And so mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. it would be, I'm, I guess I'm waiting to see the research that comes out of all of this mm -hmm. that says, you know, here's really the feedback and here's the best, you know, the best method to do virtual conferences or virtual mm -hmm. meetings or things along those lines. And I guess I just haven't, I, I haven't seen that hit the news, but maybe nobody wants to have a meeting about virtual meetings at this point. <laughs> but I think that yeah, would be I mean, really interesting research. To yeah, look at. yeah, yeah. I, wanting to find the capacity to, to I mean, there, there's so much experience obviously on our campuses with this that we ought to be able to figure it out ourselves too, do that research ourselves, just a matter of finding the capacity. Sean has his hand up. Yeah, another quick question, um, or maybe it's a long question, I don't know. Uh, I remember when a lot of us were trying to get diversity into the sustainability conversation, it was kind of the new thing, and now it's it's definitely there, and it's always going to stay there, I think, which is awesome. Are there any kind of new things on the horizon that you see are pretty exciting in the sustainability world, whether for UW or just yourself? 
um, I mean, uh, we have we have a student who's um, our DEI um, coordinator. I guess this is his title. Um, so we're definitely we're working on working on you know having a page on our website where we address um, how we work to to center diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion in our conversation. Um, I don't know that that's. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff. So me personally, I'm actually a member of what's called WEG Workforce Equity Group, which is in facilities, which I find some of the some of the um, I don't know the some of the most heartfelt conversations I have are part of that um, group trying to figure out how to to change culture and awareness. Um, there is we are actually right now in the process of analyzing responses to an RFP to get a consultant firm in to um, do an assessment of the culture of um, the EI culture in facilities and then make recommendations for changes. So there's definitely stuff happening. Very cool. How about in the broader uh, arena of sustainability as like artificial intelligence starting to play a role? Is there anything kind of crazy out there on the on the frontiers that's super exciting? Hmm. Gosh, I think you would know that more than I perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I always have crazy things, but um, I, I've, I've only asked because I know in a couple of the, um, like the WAHES calls, I've started to hear little bits of things that are like very different ways of thinking of some of the, the old problems that have been around forever. Um, so it's kind of cool to hear that there's some different thoughts, um, you know, using waste and things like that more on mm -hmm. the campuses mm -hmm. and um, different kinds of energy sources. Um, uh, you know, the methane uses. I can't remember. There was something going on on the east side that several universities wanted to go in and perhaps use energy from that um, landfill area mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. So really kind of, um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily cutting edge, but because they haven't really been put in place in the big way, they're still cutting edge. But mm -hmm. that's that to me is always fun to kind of see where different people have different kind of networks. So it's always fun to hear what's yeah. what's on someone's kind of, wow, that would be super cool kind mm -hmm. of list. You know, I, and actually, um, I think our, you know, this idea that we could potentially have our, our district energy system tap into the, the, the thermal energy in the lake to improve conditions for salmon. And um, there's actually a group that is working on a um, multi-agency effort that includes, um, you know, the county, the city, tribes, um, the federal government with the, um, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers that runs the locks, but it feels like there's potential there for the UW to get engaged with the, the community uh, in, in new ways. Yeah, cool. And, and also participate, um, you know, with, with Seattle City Light, which is a community organization essentially, because mm -hmm. um, we will be needing more electricity and and also potentially having having infrastructure that helps us use energy, you know, in a way that is grid friendly. So I think there's my real hope is that we more and more treat that as as sort of a partnership rather than you know the UW trying to do what's good for the UW. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. I, you know, I think it's a really good question, uh, Sean. And one of the things I was thinking was actually food. And one of the, you know, one of the, you know, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of new stuff there necessarily, but there, one of the things that's been happening on our campus is the idea of thinking about culturally appropriate foods and how that's really been lost in the shuffle of sort of pushing, you know, local food and so on, as opposed to figuring out so what do people want to eat right and what would actually give them sort of that cultural connection and at the same time be more plant-based and other things along those lines and that's one of the things we're trying to look at with our students now is what is it that we in our our uh, uwt garden can actually start to grow that would potentially make more of a connection between you know more of those students that are coming from other places and and access to the foods that they actually um, 
have more connection to than just growing the same old stuff that we feel like you should be growing here. So I think mm -hmm. even there, there's a lot to be done in how we think about how we, we meet the students' needs for food, for sure, and bringing in that um, equity and, and diversity mindset that it helps, I think, build the sustainability case. So, But we are uh, getting close to time, and I want to give us plenty. It, it looks like there's actually a little blue sky outside Tacoma at the mm -hmm. moment, so I'll give people a, a chance to go out and check it out before it sets and we get snow again tomorrow. So. Uh, I want to thank Marilyn for her great talk. Thank you very much for uh, giving us a, a wonderful evening. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we hope to see you May 10th. And I'll get the word out when we have our uh, speaker finalized for that. Um, but again, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks, Marilyn. Everybody have a wonderful evening. And Linda and Sean, I will get you your socks. <laughs> thanks, Take James. care, everybody.